A fellow prisoner and political opponent of Stalin's named Semya Vereshchak wrote of their time in the prison. Quote, One day a new face appeared in the Bolshevik camp. I inquired who the comrade was, and in great secrecy was told, It is Koba, Stalin. Koba stood out among the various circles as a Marxist student. He wore a blue satin smock with a wide open collar and no belt. His head was bare. A bashed leek, a sort of detached hood with two tapering scarves, was thrown across his shoulders. He always carried a book. Of more than medium height, he walked with a slow cat-like tread. He was slender, with pointed face, pockmarked skin, sharp nose, and small eyes looking out from a narrow forehead, slightly indented. He spoke little and sought no company. The Stalin of these days was defiant. He submitted to no regulations. The political prisoners at Baku endeavored to segregate themselves as much as possible from the criminals, and the younger among them were punished if they infringed this unwritten law. Openly flouting the custom, Kobo was constantly to be seen in the company of bandits, swindlers, and thieves. He chose as his cellmates the Sakva Delidze brothers, one a counterfeiter, the other a well-known Bolshevik. Active people, people who did things, attracted him. At a time when the whole prison was upset, sleepless, tense, in expectation of a night execution, Kobo would calmly compose himself in slumber. He generally enjoyed in the Caucasus the reputation of a second Lenin. He was regarded as the leading Marxist expert, hence his very special hatred of Menshevism. Speaking on Koba's life around this time, Murphy wrote, quote, Stalin could rarely reach home, and until the great release of political prisoners caused by the revolution, he spent more time in prison and exile than anywhere else. Ibid. He was exiled to Vologda in northern Russia after eight months in prison, coming down with typhus on the way there, but escaped in June 1909. He went to St. Petersburg, and then back to Baku, where he continued his work. Once back, he found party membership was down to about 200 or 300 Bolsheviks, and roughly 100 Mensheviks. He began to revive the paper as a first step in revitalizing the party. He wrote The Crisis in the Party in Our Tasks, which was published in the August 27, 1909 issue of the Baku Proletarian. In it, he wrote, quote, It is not secret that our party is passing through a severe crisis. The first factor which bears heavily on the party is the isolation of its organizations from the broad masses. It is enough to look at Petersburg, where in 1907 there were about 8,000 members, and now you will find 300 or 400. But not only is the party suffering from isolation from the masses, but also from the fact that its organizations are in no way linked with each other. Petersburg does not know what is happening in the Urals, and so forth. The existing papers published abroad, The Proletarian and The Voice, and on the other side, The Social Democrat, do not and cannot join together the scattered party organizations. And it would be strange to think that organs published abroad, remote from Russian reality, could unify the work of the party. Gray. He said that they should keep doing underground work, transfer party functions to ordinary workers, and not continue, quote, the old methods of party and the leadership from abroad, Gray. That last part was, of course, directed at the leaders living outside of the Russian Empire, which included Lenin. Gray described Koba as, quote, the practical leader in direct contact with the workers, facing hardship and anger, Ibid. He also held that they needed a party journal published in Russia, an active coordinating committee inside Russia, and to take advantage of the legal opportunities they had as well, like the Duma and trade unions. Due to the crisis, he became a bit of a conciliationist, advocating for unity between the factions. In the same issue of the Baku Proletarian, there was a resolution from the Baku Committee of the party, which Koba had written, though it was unsigned. He criticized Lenin for his fight with Bogdanov, a surgeon, Bolshevik, and Marxist philosopher, and the split that occurred in the proletarians' editorial board. Koba felt it had been a relatively small disagreement in the scheme of things, and that it should not lead to a split. In letters from 1908 and 1911, the latter written in Solvichagotsk in January, he reportedly referred to the quarrel as a, quote, storm in a teacup, gray. Lenin did find out about this eventually, and was not happy about it. Of course, Koba did not want a rift of any kind between himself and Lenin, he was just being honest about his thoughts on the matter.
In November and December of 1909, Koba wrote multiple Letters from the Caucasus, which appeared in the Social Democrat in Geneva and Paris. They dealt with relations between nationalities in the oil fields, unions, and local government. He criticized the local Mensheviks, which led to objections from the two Mensheviks, Martov and Dan, on the editorial board of the Social Democrat. Lenin, Zinoviev, and Kamenev were the other members. Koba and the Bolsheviks focusing on Mensheviks so much may appear to be an obsession, but the latter were their closest rivals for the support of the workers. At one point, the Bolsheviks and Mensheviks were called hards and softs, respectively, and this was fitting in many ways. Quote, For it invariably happened that the Mensheviks expressed all the doubts and fears and weaknesses which beset the workers and the peasants. For them, the defeat of the 1905 revolution was overwhelming. Murphy they said the workers shouldn't have taken up arms and could not lead the revolution. They said the bourgeoisie must lead the revolution. The Bolsheviks acknowledged the defeat of the 1905 revolution, but said there would be another revolution and that the workers, allied with the peasants, should lead it. Lenin applauded Kobo's letters from the Caucasus, which is where his struggle with Trotsky began. Following his arrest and imprisonment in 1898, Trotsky spent the vast majority of his time abroad in Europe only returning on the day of the first meeting of the St. Petersburg Soviet in 1905. After another arrest, imprisonment, and escape from exile, he again left for Europe, where he would stay for some time. According to Murphy, quote, His experience in the Russian working class movement prior to 1917 was essentially the experience of an émigré. He did play his own significant role, though. However, quote, from the outset of his acquaintance with Lenin, he became an opponent of the Bolsheviks in general, and of Lenin in particular. Ibid. He originally sided with the Mensheviks, then he took a position between the two factions, making calls for unity where it was impossible. He reserved, quote, the most bitter of his polemics for Lenin and the Bolsheviks. Ibid. In 1904, for example, Trotsky attacked Lenin and his concept of the party. He called Lenin a quote, fanatical secessionist, a revolutionary bourgeois democrat, an organization fetishist, a partisan of the army mentality and of organizational pettiness, a dictator wanting to substitute himself for the central committee, a dictator wanting to impose dictatorship on the proletariat, for whom any mixture of elements thinking differently is a pathological phenomenon. As Martins wrote, quote, Note that this hatred was directed, not at the infamous Stalin, but rather at his revered master, Lenin. That book, published by Trotsky in 1904, is crucial to understanding his ideology. He made himself known as an unrepentant bourgeois individualist. All the slanders and insults that he would direct 25 years later against Stalin, he had already hurled in that work against Lenin. When Lenin created the Bolshevik party, Trotsky claimed he had created an quote, orthodox theocracy, and a, quote, autocratic Asiatic centralism. Concerning Lenin's one step forward, two steps back, Trotsky wrote, quote, one cannot show more cynicism for the ideological heritage of the proletariat as does Comrade Lenin. For him, Marxism is not a scientific method of analysis. Again, he would make similar claims about Stalin in the future. In 1904, he also came up with the term substitutionism to attack the Leninist party. Quote, the professional revolutionary group acted in the place of the proletariat. Quote, the organization substitutes itself for the party, the central committee for the organization and its financing, and the dictator for the central committee. He also claimed that the Bolshevik party, quote, separated the conscious activity from the executive activity, there is a center, and underneath, there are only disciplined executives of technical functions. Martens wrote, quote, In his bourgeois individualist worldview, Trotsky rejected the hierarchy and the different levels of responsibility and discipline. His ideal was, quote, The global political personality who imposes on all centers his will in all possible forms, including boycott. Trotsky also wrote in 1904 that Lenin was blinded by, quote, the bureaucratic logic of such and such organizational plan, but, quote, the fiasco of organizational fetishism was certain. The head of the reactionary wing of our party, Comrade Lenin, 
gives social democracy a definition that is a theoretical attack against the class nature of our party. Lenin formulated a tendency for the party, the revolutionary bourgeois tendency. He accused the supposed bureaucrat Lenin of terrorizing the party as well. Quote, the task of Iskra, Lenin's newspaper, was to theoretically terrorize the intelligentsia. For social democrats educated in this school, orthodoxy is something close to the absolute truth that inspired the Jacobins, French revolutionary democrats. Orthodox truth foresees everything. Those who contest are excluded. Those who doubt are on the verge of being excluded. Trotsky would later throw all of these claims and accusations at Stalin and the Bolshevik party in later years, from around the 20s on, in one form or another. Of course, he would join the Bolsheviks just a few months before the October Revolution. However, his views had not changed all that much. In writings from around the time of the 1905 Revolution, he, for example, claimed that the peasantry and proletariat would inevitably come into conflict with one another, that the revolution would fail without the support of other, more civilized European countries, and other anti-Leninist claims. He republished new editions of two such books after the October Revolution, Results and Prospects, from 1906, in 1919, and the year 1905, in 1922, and stated he still viewed them as correct. His 1922 preface for the year 1905 restated and argued for the correctness of its political line, and in his 1919 preface for Results and Prospects, he wrote, quote, I consider the train of ideas and its main ramifications very nearly approaches the conditions of our time. This was calling for defeatism against the revolution, and made clear the fact that he was still not a Leninist. So why did he join the Bolsheviks? Quote, On the wave of the revolution of 1917, he capitulated to Lenin as the master revolutionary, in the Elijah hope that in due time the master's mantle would fall upon him. Murphy. While Koba was organizing and agitating in Baku, Trotsky was in Europe making attacks on the Bolsheviks. Toward the end of January 1910, the Baku Committee put out another Koba written resolution, which stated that, quote, the state of despondency and apathy that had been affecting the forces of the revolution was dissipating. Gray. It again pushed for a leading practical center and national newspaper inside Russia, and local papers in important party centers. It was also suggested that Bolsheviks should unite with Mensheviks who supported underground activity, and that all others, liquidators, should be expelled. Koba was trying to bring about a general strike in the oil industry of the Caucasus when he was arrested again on March 23, 1910, and spent six more months in Bailov prison before being exiled to Solovy He got out June 27, 1911, but was banned from the Caucasus, St. Petersburg, and Moscow for five years. He chose to stay in Vologda, but went illegally to St. Petersburg on September 6, where he was arrested yet again and exiled to Vologda for three years. Needless to say, he was very, very annoyed, especially because it caused him to miss an important party conference in January 1912. He had been advocating for a new conference, a legal newspaper, and the formation of an illegal organizational center in Russia for months. At the conference, held in Prague, the Mensheviks were finally expelled from the party. Lenin knew that a new wave of revolution was coming, and thought they would severely hamper the party. Quote, Everything that had happened since he wrote his book, What is to be Done, had endorsed the convictions expressed within its pages. Murphy. He also put into action the suggestions that Stalin, who actually started going by Stalin around this time, had made about the organizing center and newspaper. He sent Sergo or John Akidze to visit Stalin in exile in February, fill him in on what happened at the conference, and tell him that he had been put in charge of the Russian Bureau of the Central Committee. Quote, Thus Stalin became second in command of the Bolshevik party. To have held him in Vologda after receiving this news, it would have been necessary to put him in chains. Ibid. On February 29, 1912, he escaped again in the bitter winter conditions, making his way to St. Petersburg before going back to Baku. Quote, His existence was precarious in the extreme. Ibid. The police were after him, and he felt he couldn't stay in the same place for more than a night at a time. He didn't know that another member of the party's central committee was also a member of the Akrana, who gave hints to his handlers on Stalin's location. A friend and fellow party member from the Caucasus named Sergei Aleluyev 
had moved to St. Petersburg, where he was a foreman in an electrical station. He had a wife, two sons, and two daughters. Stalin was a friend of the family and sometimes stayed with them. During the preparations for the Bolsheviks' first legal newspaper, Pravda, meaning truth, in April 1912, which Stalin was attending to in St. Petersburg, Lenin had entrusted it to him, a substantial event occurred in the Lena goldfields of Siberia. Tsarist soldiers had shot hundreds of striking workers, which led to a wave of strikes in the industrial areas of Russia. Stalin said, quote, The superficial observer might have thought that the day of revolution had been lost forever, that the period of constitutional development of Russia along the lines of Prussia had arrived. And certain old Bolsheviks, sympathizing at heart with preachings to that effect, were at that time leaving the ranks. The triumph of the now and of darkness was complete. The Lena days broke upon this malodorous morass like a hurricane and revealed a new scene to everybody. It appeared that the Stolopin regime was not so solid. The Duma had aroused contempt in the masses and the workers had stored up sufficient energy to throw themselves into battle for a new revolution. It was enough to shoot down workers in the depths of Siberia for Russia to be inundated by strikes and for the St. Petersburg proletariat to pour into the streets and wipe out with one stroke the impudent slogan of the braggart minister Makarov that it has always been so and will always remain so. Ibid. Vyacheslav Skryabin was the secretary of the editorial board of Pravda. He would later be known as Molotov. The title Pravda had been intentionally taken from Trotsky's paper, published abroad, of the same name. It was a popular paper smuggled into Russia, and the new Pravda took much of its readership while promoting different policies. Trotsky was upset but couldn't do anything about it except stop publishing his own paper. Pravda was published on April 22, 1912, and Stalin was arrested again the same day. Other members of the bureau would be arrested soon after, thanks to the moles. This time, he was sent to the Nurem district of Siberia, but escaped back to St. Petersburg by September, where he resumed work on Pravda. The editorial board of Pravda took a careful, conciliationist approach, which seemed to help its circulation, but upset Lenin. Stalin made it back in time for the elections of the Fourth Duma, to which six Bolsheviks were elected. He instructed them to publicize demands of the workers, promote revolution, and not take part, quote, in the empty game of legislation in the ruling Duma. Gray. Lenin was pleased with his instructions, but not with the Bolsheviks and Mensheviks uniting in the largely reactionary Duma. He called a meeting of the party's central committee about it, and one was held in Krakow, where he was now living. Stalin knew a split would be inevitable, but didn't think forcing one now would be a good idea and would cost them support. The deputies didn't want this either. Lenin called another meeting, this time including the six Bolshevik deputies. He got Stalin and the deputies to agree to an open split. For two months, Stalin remained in Krakow and Vienna, staying with Lenin for several weeks, where they were able to discuss their views on the issues at hand freely for the first time. In a letter to Maxim Gorky from February 1913, Lenin wrote, quote, As regards nationalism, I am fully in agreement with you that we ought to take this up more seriously. We have a marvelous Georgian who has sat down to write a big article for Prosveshchenny, for which he has collected all the Austrian and other materials. It was published in three parts, and eventually as the book Marxism and the National Question. It had an important influence on the revolution. It was written entirely by Stalin but Lenin likely contributed through their discussions and notes. Quote, Lenin had been Stalin's hero ever since the latter's early years at Tiflis. To spend days on end with Lenin and become a collaborator with him in leadership was to fulfill the dream of his young manhood. Murphy. They had worked together for conferences, but this was different. It was the first time Lenin had called on a colleague to take on a task like this. Murphy remarked, quote, I do not know of Lenin taking this course on any other question or with any other of his colleagues. Ibid. Murphy, who had met Lenin and Stalin, also said he knew that Lenin, quote, had great confidence in Stalin's theoretical opinions and sound judgment as a Marxist. During a conversation Murphy had with Lenin in 1921, the latter called Stalin, quote, our nutcracker, and told him that if the, quote, political bureau were faced with a problem which needed a lot of sorting out, Stalin was given the job. Ibid. When the Bolsheviks came to power, Lenin had Stalin appointed as the first minister of the USSR to handle the national and colonial questions, and quote, in every subsequent conference, he was the reporter on it, drafted every relevant resolution for the Central Committee, 
and adapted the Soviet constitution to the principles he had expounded with conviction and lucidity. Ibid. The national and colonial questions were important issues, and there had been a lot of confusion around them. There were millions of so-called foreigners in the Russian Empire, split into national groups, and they were oppressed and exploited. Of the empire's population of 124.2 million at the turn of the century, there were 22.5 million Ukrainians, 7.9 million Poles, 5 million Jews, 1.65 million Lithuanians, 1.4 million Lets, and 1.35 million Georgians. Gray. Finland had a population of 3 million. Ibid. Around the world, millions of people were subjugated by colonialism, and millions more lived in areas that were only partly independent. Marx had maintained years earlier that no nation could itself be free as long as it held another in bondage, and Marxists firmly supported national self-determination. Labor parties in Russia formed along national and ethnic lines, something the RSDLP tried to combat. They wanted to include all socialists in their ranks. Stalin's book gave some guidance through the confusion. Of the text, Murphy said, quote, The result of Stalin's labor will always stand high among the records of scientific socialism. Indeed, it is a well-known and highly regarded work to this day. In it, Stalin ultimately summarized his definition of a nation like this. A nation is a historically constituted, stable community of people formed on the basis of a common language, territory, economic life, and psychological makeup manifested in a common culture. It goes without saying that a nation, like every historical phenomenon, is subject to the law of change, has its history, has its beginning and end. It must be emphasized that none of the above characteristics taken separately is sufficient to define a nation. More than that, it is sufficient for a single one of these characteristics to be lacking, and the nation ceases to be a nation. In the book, The Reasons Behind These Qualifications, Other Definitions of a Nation, Nationalism, and more are discussed. He went on to say, Thus, the right of self-determination is an essential element in the solution of the national question. Further, what must be our attitude towards nations which for one reason or another will prefer to remain within the framework of the whole? The only correct solution is regional autonomy, autonomy for such crystallized units as Poland, Lithuania, the Ukraine, the Caucasus, etc. The advantage of regional autonomy consists, first of all, in the fact that it does not deal with a fiction bereft of territory, but with a definite population inhabiting a definite territory. Next, it does not divide people according to nations, it does not strengthen national barriers. On the contrary, it breaks down these barriers and unites the population in such a manner as to open the way for division of a different kind, division according to classes. Of course, not one of the regions constitutes a compact, homogeneous nation for each is interspersed with national minorities, such are the Jews in Poland, the Lets in Lithuania, the Russians in the Caucasus, the Poles in the Ukraine, and so on. What is it that particularly agitates a national minority? A minority is discontented not because there is no national union, but because it does not enjoy the right to use its native language. Permit it to use its native language, and the discontent will pass of itself. Thus, equal rights of nations in all forms, language, schools, etc., is an essential element in the solution of the national question. We know where the demarcation of workers according to nationalities leads to, the disintegration of a United Workers' Party, splitting of trade unions according to nationalities, aggravation of national friction, national strike-breaking, complete demoralization within the ranks of social democracy. Such are the results of organizational federalism. The only cure for this is organization on the basis of internationalism. To unite locally the workers of all nationalities of Russia into single, integral collective bodies. To unite these collective bodies into a single party, such as the task. Thus, the principle of international solidarity of the workers is an essential element in the solution of the national question. Vienna, January 1913, J. Stalin. Lenin was pleased with the text, writing that it, quote, stands out in first place. Gray. When Marxism and the national question was finished, Stalin made his way back to St. Petersburg, resuming the new duties of central leadership the party had given to him. Once there, he got an apartment, and his landlady recalled many years later that, quote, he was very earnest, quiet, and considerate. Ibid. 
However, he realized he was being shadowed more closely than ever before. The police spy, Malinovsky, had also been in Krakow, knew all the new information, and was helping the police in getting rid of party leadership. They were now after Stalin, having already arrested Zverdlov, a fellow member of the Central Bureau, on February 9th. Stalin was hesitant to attend a Pravda benefit concert, but Malinovsky assured him the police wouldn't arrest him at such a public event. Of course, on February 23rd, 1913, he was promptly arrested again at that benefit concert in St. Petersburg, later followed by Kamenev, Spandarian, and the Bolshevik Duma deputies. They were all sent to Siberia. Stalin spent five months in a St. Petersburg prison, then was sent to Monastirsko in a remote region called Turukansk, before being sent to Karaika, Siberia, in the Arctic Circle, in early 1914. This was a harsher exile than the previous ones. Gray wrote of the conditions, quote, Men went mad, and the suicide rate among the exiles was high. Tsarist officials were determined that he would not escape again, and he stayed there under close observation until Tsarism fell. Lenin attempted to free Stalin and Zverdlov twice in the months after their arrests, but Malinovsky tipped off the police both times, and the guards were strengthened. Stalin's capacity to wait would be tested more than ever before. Quote, a thin, frequently interrupted line of contact with the world beyond the Arctic Circle was maintained, through which he could occasionally influence the course of events, but his main task was to wait and watch as best as he might, and a fierce, somber mood took hold of him as he brooded over the course of events. Murphy But the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand, while not the true cause, helped ignite the long-brewing tension between the imperialist powers, sparking the Great War. Quote, the barricades of the Russian working class fell, the war drums rolled, and the armies dutifully assembled and marched under the banners of the kings and emperors and presidents of the world of capitalism. Ibid. The prospect of revolution appeared to be disappearing, but the course of history had actually sped up, approaching the new dawn those in exile had dreamed of and worked for.